bloating is a serious and painful condition. It can have a lot of medical and health ramifications, which I'll talk about later. The critical thing about bloating is to understand that it is treatable as long as you can understand a little bit about it. The first part of bloating, and here I'm not talking about um, the occasional, oh, geez, I feel like my stomach is full. I'm talking, uh, we're talking the intestinal bloating here, not, not a feeling of fullness in your stomach, but uh, half an hour after a meal, an hour, maybe even two hours after the meal, your intestines feel distended, they actually feel hard, uh, and this might go on for uh, a half an hour or an hour, uh, but it reoccurs virtually or frequently after your meals. Or for some people, it can be almost permanent. I've met people who've come along to my talks and we've discussed it and worked on solutions with them. And, and they've said they don't get any relief from anything that they do. And so they walk around, they can't sit down, they can't lay down, they have to lay in particular positions to get some um, comfort out of the pain that they're suffering. And as I said, it is a real health condition because it's linked with so many other health conditions that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. But the first part about the bloating is there are three major types. There are lots of various combinations and possibilities, but there are three major types or, or causes of bloating. And the first of these is food intolerance. And in food intolerance, it's lactose, which is one of the conditions, and fructose. Now in a study that they did where they got a, about 130 people and they looked at the various conditions that are leading up to the bloating. And one of the things that they can do for both, uh, for all of these tests is to actually do a breath test. And so they did the lactose breath test and 44% had lactose intolerant of the people who had bloating. So that's an easy one because guess what? That's in dairy. The first and foremost thing is get rid of the dairy and that will probably eliminate a lot of these, probably. Then we've got fructose showed up in 34% of the participants, of the patients who had severe bloating, reoccurring bloating. And fructose is obviously, we're not talking about, well, in their condition, they were reacting to fruits and so on, but it was primarily initiated and brought about by the use of sweeteners added to just about everything in our 21st century diet. And so the message here is you have to avoid fructose. So those two alone can make a big difference in getting rid of bloating. But I imagine already you've already tried those. And so the third major condition, and the one I want to focus on today, and it'll have both benefits for both of the other conditions as well, is something called SIBO. And 33%, you'll notice it's over 100%, that's because there's overlap with the conditions. But 33% of the people who have bloating had SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Now there are other variations of the condition, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, and other variations which I might go into, but essentially what is happening is in the small intestine where it should have low numbers of microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, viruses, archaea, protozoa, all those things, the numbers are far too high and they're exacerbating and causing the problem. And as a result of that, they're producing a lot of gas. When bacteria try to break down foods, they ferment. We digest, they ferment. And when they ferment, you'll know from a bottle of wine or a bottle of beer, it sends gases up. And the problem with SIBO is that these bacteria are fermenting and there's nowhere for the gas to go. It can't come up with a burp because it's too far down and literally it's too far up to go down as a fluff. So the message is it's stuck there. Where does it go? It bloats out, it pushes out. Now that also causes other conditions in there. For example, it will draw in extra moisture, water and so on, and that can lead to constipation and a whole raft of other conditions in there linked in with it. But the primary thing is the gas has no way to escape. So what we're after in the program, which I'll show you in, in a moment, is how to stop all that occurring right from the beginning. So with SIBO, 33% had SIBO. And the conditions were bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, and or diarrhea, and of course, belching, trying to get rid of some of that gas. And um, the gas part, while some can escape because that's how one of the main tests for SIBO and SIFO and these other conditions. So you can get a breath test for those conditions. So what causes SIBO 
is really important to understand because if you understand what causes it, you can look and say, okay, which ones of those do I need to modify right now before I even get on to the other things that I'm going to suggest you? And the first one comes down to diet. There is no doubt about the processed food diet. The 21st century diet um, leads to and contributes to the development of all of your gut illnesses. And as I'll show you in a moment, SIBO doesn't occur on its own. And this is a problem with where most people deal with bloating. They go, oh, okay, let's fix the bloating here. Well, believe it or not, um, bloating down here can be linked right up with dental decay and other issues right through the body, right through the digestive system. So diet plays havoc with your small intestine. And if you're on a processed diet, um, you dramatically increase your risk of developing SIBO. So one of the first things you're gonna realize now is, okay, I need to get on a highly nutritious program. Lots of diet, you'll see my other videos. Please, at this point, subscribe below, check out my channel. I've got so many videos. And in fact, I'm going to suggest right now that you, as soon as you watch this one, you watch the one on reflux and the one on LPR. I'll describe that to you later. But those two will link directly into this one. And, and subscribe, please, and, and share so we can get this information out there because I hate seeing people suffer. And so what we've got is diet plays a major role in this. Then you've got stress because stress shuts down the whole digestive system, the whole body in many ways. And uh, linked in with it, whether it's linked in with other factors. Usually it's not one thing alone, but a constellation or a combination of different things. Stress, obesity. When they looked at the studies on children, they found that something like 37.6% of obese children had SIBO. 37.6%, that's huge. And that's obviously reflecting on diet and maybe even stress and other factors in there too. But that is absolutely huge compared to, so, so more than 10 times a higher rate in obese kids, the same will occur in adults. That's why one of the things we need to do is look at some really simple strategic ways of losing weight at the same time, which is what I talk about. And of course, I yes, I have a video on that, so you can check it out in, in terms of the seven secrets to permanent weight loss. Um, then you've got gastric operations. Uh, anything that works around your gut, and that may be removal of the gallbladder, uh, or it may be um, a, a gastric banding or something else so that you can lose weight. What they don't tell you in that is that you end up with a very, 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 get the idea, high risk of developing SIBO, permanent bloating, unless you can do something about it beforehand. And of course, um, SIBO is linked with weight loss and actually weight gain as well. So, so we've got gastric operations and then you've got these two little nasties here, Helicobacter and Candida. And um, both of those, Helicobacter is a bacteria found throughout the di digestive system, but it's linked with the development of ulcers and ultimately uh, gastric cancers and so on. And a lot of research is done on that. It's very, very simple to treat. And again, along with Candida, which is a fungi, it's a yeast. And that will show up as thrust. So you might find that you've got either this one and or this one, um, as a and you've got bloating. So it's suggesting, hold on, they're all linked together. So when you treat this, you, you can fix that and you can fix that at the same time. Sounds good, doesn't it? And of course, uh, I have a uh, I have a program on natural ways to eradicate Helicobacter, looking at that big picture and Candida as well. So what I'm trying to do is create this whole picture here, and. Then we find that people who have thyroid problems have a dramatic, something like 50% of people with thyroid problems have uh, an increased risk of SIBO. And people who have SIBO have an increased risk of thyroid problems. And one of the reasons, and I'll, I'll just throw this in now, is the movement of foods through the intestines, the stomach and small intestine will obviously affect the growth of bacteria and fungi in the small intestine. And thyroid um, problems, in particular hypothyroid and underactive thyroid, can play havoc with the movement of food through the digestive tract and other aspects of digestion. So then you've got drugs, uh, and these are these are the drugs that you are not allowed to take. Um, absolutely show up, narcotics and so on show up with uh, links to SIBO. And then you've got your pharmaceutical drugs, and here you've got protein pump inhibitors, 50% of um, uh, people who take proton pump inhibitors develop bloating and SIBO 
um, uh, as a result of the drug because the, the proton pump inhibitors alter the whole gastric pH, which later on you'll see is critical. It's critical to get rid of the bloating. And then you've got antibiotics and um, antibiotics, the overuse of antibiotics again leads to all of these gastrointestinal disorders one way or um, Interesting, some studies have shown that artificial sweeteners, they're the, the non-nutritive artificial sweeteners that they put in lots of the soft drinks and so on. Everyone thinks, oh, I'm doing good. Well, interestingly, they lead to weight gain and they lead to uh, worse situations in obesity and they also lead to an increase in the risk of SIBO. So again, let's get back to a healthier nutritional dietary program. And then finally, alcohol can be a contributing factor to SIBO. And uh, you will already probably know that if you've got the bloating and you avoid it. Interestingly enough, it tends to be spirits that exacerbate or cause the problem, although wine and beer may exacerbate the problem. The condition appears to be mainly as a result of spirits. So what I've done here is given you a bit of a background and an understanding so that we can then at the next stage look at ways of fixing it. To understand SIBO, you have to understand that it's not just about the small intestine, it's about the whole digestive system, in fact, the whole body. And you can see that when you look at all the gut-related conditions and the fact that there's an increased percentage and ratio of people who, when they've got SIBO, have those conditions, and when they've got those conditions, they're more likely to have SIBO. For example, a person with SIBO is more likely to have oral health problems, gingivitis and tooth decay, LPR, laryngeopharyngeal reflux, which is, I've got a video on that, so I'd really suggest you look at that because that is a part of the SIBO solution. So why don't, while you're at it, subscribe below, check up the one on LPR, and you'll find that it links with this. And then you've got gastrophoresis. So 39% of people with gastrophoresis, which is a delaying of the stomach emptying, so it sits in the stomach a lot longer, have SIBO. Now, isn't that telling you something? So they measure the, the effect that, that you can, they can measure the fact that the person has SIBO through their breath test, and 39% have. Yes, because it's all linked together. It's all connected. Then you've got an increase in reflux um, of something like 24.5% uh, uh, of people who have uh, inflammatory, yeah, sorry, irritable bowel syndrome and an increase of inflammatory bowel disease as well as celiac disease. It didn't matter which one you'd look at, they would all have higher rates as a result of having SIBO and because they've got those conditions, they're more likely to have SIBO. So it's about dealing with the whole digestive system. And then you look at other conditions too throughout the whole body and you find that 50%, 50% of people who have hypothyroid actually have SIBO. So this is really, really huge. Cardiovascular wise, there's a two times increase, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and fatty liver are all increased if you've got SIBO. And if you've got those conditions, you're more likely to have SIBO. Why? Because they're all connected one way or another. Neurological conditions such as Parkinson's and brain fog. We know that brain fog is a very typical symptom of SIBO caused by primarily something called D-lactate. Very, very simple to fix up with that one. You'll see in the next video. And then you've got arthritis. 35% of um, people with rheumatoid arthritis have SIBO in this one study, 35%. So you can see the link there. Kidney, chronic kidney disease, pancreatitis, acute and chronic um, uh, gallstones. 15% of, of people with gallstone issues had SIBO and there's a good reason why it's such a if you have a look at the percentage there compared to 0.7 that that is about 23 times higher levels then you've got skin conditions like rosacea 25 to 40 percent fibromyalgia chronic fatigue syndrome and malnutrition are all intimately linked with SIBO and SIBO linked with them so the solution lies in dealing with the whole problem, whole body problem, and the whole digestive problem at the same time.